Thank you so much, and I'm very grateful to the organizers, to this institute, for inviting me to speak here. This is the very first time that I address the um, computer science community and you know, some mathematicians. Uh, uh, now, uh, it's a little bit unusual, so my talk, so the first 20 minutes is somewhat historical. Lettuces, I know that you guys are interested in lettuces. And then there'll be some glimpses of arithmetic geometry, things that I do, and hopefully maybe connecting uh, to some of the questions that you're interested in. So this is a library of the Mathematics Institute at the University of Göttingen, where I was uh, for five years at the Institute, most of the time in this library. And uh, uh, there I found uh, interesting manuscripts, and in particular I learned about Minkowski, who was a professor in Göttingen. So here is Minkowski in his uh, uh, yeah, years. Uh, just a little bit about his uh, family. Uh, well, among his ancestors, a judge who then uh, decided to switch fields and studied medicine and practiced medicine, and then uh, translated Euclid from Greek into Hebrew, obviously trying to make it more accessible. And then some other ancestor uh, changed the name and became Minkowski, and then a few generations later, there are these five children, Maxim, Oscar, Fanny, Herman, and Toby. And uh, uh, well, so uh, Minkowski himself was born 1864 in Alexoten, that uh, uh, was, uh, was complicated. It belonged to different states at different times. It moved back and forth. In any event, the family moved to Königsberg, which was Germany. And uh, Minkowski studied at this very, very special high school for mathematics and other sciences uh, in uh, Königsberg. And uh, uh, that high school had a library which had, in particular, the Kreller Journal for Mathematics in it and other things. And so Hilbert was his friend uh, in high school. And so at a very young age, uh, uh, he won uh, the Grand Prix, the big prize of the French Academy of Sciences for some works that he had started in high school, and I'll talk more about this. Then, you know, uh, Army Service, Habilitation, became professor in Bonn, came back to Königsberg, uh, then moved to Zurich, and uh, ended up in Göttingen, where he died in 1909. So he died very suddenly. So this is the obituary written by uh, Hilbert uh, maybe hard to read, but I'm going to translate. So for six years, every Thursday, punctually at 3 p.m., we took our mathematical walk, as we did last Thursday. On Sunday, he suffered a ruptured appendicitis and passed away on uh, Tuesday noon. This Thursday, again at 3 p.m., we have buried him. So he was in his you know, 40s. He died as he lived, as a philosopher. Several hours before his death, he was still proofreading his papers. He deplored his fate as he could have done so much more, but he was also saying that his latest work on electrodynamics would perhaps benefit from his withdrawal. So, uh, well, anyway, if you're interested, you can then look at slides. So this is his graveyard, uh, uh, I mean, in Berlin. So it's a cemetery in Berlin. Now, there is something very special here. You see this red brick? So this is a designation that uh, uh, he is a distinguished Berliner buried layer, or something like this. It's a big distinction, which gets reviewed every 25 years. And two years ago, it was up for renewal, <laughs> and the city government decided not to renew it. So there was an exchange. You know, I wrote a supporting letter as well. I was asked to be in as a representative of the Simons Foundation to explain that Minkowski is very important for Berlin. We lost the case. But I have my satisfaction. The mayor was removed a month later. <laughs> so clearly, he did not survive this. Yes, we're getting there. So <laughs> no, they didn't help. Uh, that didn't help. Now, uh, OK, so that's uh, Minkowski's house in Göttingen. And uh, now, his mathematics. So Einstein asked the following question. How many ways are there to represent uh, positive integers a sum of five squares? OK, and this appeared in this Kreller journal that uh, 
Minkowski had as, in his library. Now, the sum of three squares was kind of understood. Sum of five squares was interesting. Now, when you do this arithmetic geometry and you're asked to find, you know, number of solutions of, let's say, C as a number of three squared. So you're solving equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals C. So you homogenize and say equals C squared. And because you're doing geometry, you realize, oh, well, that's very interesting, this interaction arithmetic and geometry. So you shouldn't be surprised that Minkowski came up with this Minkowski space because he was just interested in representing numbers as sums of three squares and five squares. So this is where I think it's all coming from. Now, uh, so that was a big prize question that was submitted, let's see, uh, posed by the French Academy. They used to have these competitions. Whoever solves whatever that problem gets a prize. And uh, the competition was, well, can you solve this problem of uh, Einstein uh, sum of five squares? Now, it turns out that when they posed this question, it had been solved already, like decades before, and published in the leading journal in the UK. But since UK wasn't part of Europe at that time, and so anyway, the French didn't read that leading journal. And uh, so there is this person, Henry John Stephen Smith, who actually solves that. And so, okay, um, now a little bit about this uh, person. Um, that uh, Henry John Stephen Smith. Um, now, he was um, the president of the London Mathematical Society. He was uh, received many honors and awards, like degrees from Cambridge, honorary degrees, Cambridge, Dublin, two royal commissions, uh, and so on and so on, like leading scientists of that time, right? Now, uh, so, uh, so it's kind of interesting from his obituary. In 1873, he freed himself from the worst of his drudgery, the college lectureship, by accepting a flattering and generous offer from Corpus Christi College on a fellowship upon that foundation. The office gave him a pleasant house, a small stipend, and not very uncongenial duties, half as master, half as servant. So this is how he wanted to live. And so it also says that uh, uh, he was uh, very nice, generally. He never allowed his inimitable persiflage to pass the boundary line into sarcasm. And uh, anyway, he also had a speculative element in his nature and had invested so much money in mines, almost always, I'm afraid, unremunerative, that it became important now and again to eke out his regular income. Now, so then he became the chair of the meteorological office, and the work was especially congenial, and the associates were so considerate and able as to give a charm to toil, and Henry Smith enjoyed the fortnightly visit to London and the temporary rest from the turmoil of Oxford business. So the idea that he kind of had to escape Oxford to get some respite in London. Anyway, so this is like a star of his time, and so he writes to the French asking, well, uh, what happened? And uh, uh, so that's his paper. It, the paper starts with the first word here is Eisenstein. It's unmistakable, Eisenstein. And so then uh, it's all about uh, you know, quadratic forms, interpretation of integers. And so he writes to uh, Hermit and he says, well, first he consults with his friends. You know, I'm a little bit annoyed. You know, what, what should I do? You know, tenderness of feeling. Uh, and they tell him, well, just write. He writes to Hermit. Hermit says, oh, mon cher monsieur, désolé, it's not me. It's some, they had no idea that it was published in the leading journal, circumstances, da, 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 da. Anyway, so there's all of that. And uh, they tell him, why don't you resubmit your published paper? So, now, uh, Meanwhile, so he decides to resubmit it, you know, to write it up in a little bit and change this and that. And then he has an accident by writing. And so first he's in bed, then he dies. So, uh, okay. Meanwhile, uh, you know, Hermit says, uh, you know, I volunteer, I'm so sorry. Okay, so that's it. So, uh, the committee there in France receives two papers, one from Minkowski, this high school student, essentially, and one from this established mathematician. Now, uh, the conditions where you have to submit in French. 
Minkowski sends it in, in German and says, I'm sorry, I have no time to translate this into French. Uh, Smith is working very hard on translating his stuff into French and doesn't you know, completely succeed. And uh, so the committee gives two prizes. Uh, okay, now this came up again. Uh, so here is a little note from Serre in, the, I guess, Bulletin of the French Mass Society or something, uh, where he says, so here we are seeing a uh, mathematician Allemand, a uh, German mathematician, um, uh, who writes in French, that's Einstein. In the paper, the original paper is actually in French. A uh, mathematician uh, from England who does the same. Then some members of the academy in Paris is don't read English. And then, but they give uh, a prize to a paper submitted in German against all the rules. And so then Sarah says, well, anyway, the languages are not that important, the ideas are important, and that should be the moral of the story. And that nous sera peut-être utile quand nous discuterons de la réforme de la contre-endue. In any event, it keeps coming up even today. Now, so here are some letters that I discovered in Germany. I took these uh, pictures. Um, so teaching in Bonn. Minkowski is teaching in Bonn and is writing, uh, it is quite frustrating to communicate with my mathematics colleagues. One complains about headache all the time, and another, his wife steps in every five minutes to turn the conversation to something else. How are you supposed to do mathematics? Now, um, so we said letters to Hilbert from Minkowski. So that's about his colleagues in Bonn. So this is uh, him at that time. So then he moves to Zurich. So he thinks it's better in Zurich, but it's not much better in Zurich. In mathematics, he says, I have 14 listeners, and since most of them are practitioners applied, I have to take great care not to become too mathematical. I'm lecturing something between mathematical and practical mechanics, sometimes even more practical than Klein would like. In function theory, I have all the math majors, that is, four, and here in brackets, he writes, this is a dash sign and not a minus sign. <laughs> okay. Now among his students was Einstein, and who then wrote this was the first mass physics course that we ever heard. And Minkowski to his assistant, born, ah, the Einstein, well, the Einstein, he always skipped my lectures. I wouldn't have guessed that he was capable of anything, not to mention special relativity. And then he writes, well, in spite of all my efforts to adjust to the level of students and preparations for my lectures, I have fewer and fewer listeners. Even the mathematicians, of which there are very few, are, some, are so busy with various administrative tasks that they can only swallow what is forcefully shoveled down their throats. Okay. So, and so he writes to the, Hilbert, can you help me you know, leave this place? Now, of course, he had you know, very thoughtful colleagues in Zurich. They immediately made him uh, the head of the entertainment committee of the Mathematical Congress that was in Zurich around this time. Okay, so then I found these letters, uh, Hilbert's Problems, you know, the famous Hilbert's Problems. It was actually Minkowski's idea that Hilbert should come up with something like this. So Minkowski writes that, uh, well, this would be really, really special. And um, uh, mm, it would be great to try uh, to look into the future and to specify some problems uh, uh, which would become challenges for future mathematicians. And so here you could uh, uh, reach something. Uh, one would be uh, talking about you even decades from now. Uh, okay. Now, you should uh, pay attention to the following. Uh, uh, first of all, don't tell them what you're working on immediately. And secondly, the themes of philosophical nature should perhaps be left for the German audience uh, rather than the international. Uh, and some French mathematician will probably talk uh, about you know, past and presence. And so you should somehow figure out what Poincaré will say. Now, of course, if you read the lecture of Poincaré on logic and intuition and mathematics, where he, well, talks about Klein and 
a lot of German mathematicians. In any event, so several months later comes the letter, well, Hilbert formulates the problems and writes a draft of his uh, presentation. And so here uh, he writes, so uh, dear Freud, dein Vortrag, uh, your uh, uh, talk, I mean, I read this uh, uh, great pleasure, and uh, uh, I have to congratulate you on, on this. It will be a huge success, and uh, uh, it, every mathematician without exception uh, will, will read this, and uh, your reputation will grow even more. So that's uh, Hilbert's problems. Now, uh, okay, uh, some, some other things from Minkowski. Uh, Publish things. So we hear all the time about uh, uh, making mathematics more and more uh, arithmetical. Uh, so some think that arithmetics, number theory arithmetics, will become uh, perhaps uh, state police of the state of mathematics. Uh, uh, well, but for me, I think uh, a true arithmetician is an enthusiast per se, without Enthusiasm, no arithmetic. And I'm a great optimi optimist for arithmetic, and there will be a time uh, when arithmetic will become truly foundational uh, for physics. Mm, and for example, questions such as representation of an integer of a prime as a sum of two squares is gonna play a role in physics. And at that time, mathematicians and number theorists will be appreciated by everybody around. Now, okay, so this is half uh, jokingly, but you know, what does it mean to represent a prime as a sum of two squares? Well, this is quadratic reciprocity. And I hear there are programs at the Institute of Advanced Study discussing, you know, Langman's program and higher reciprocity in connection with, you know, some problems in mathematical physics, okay. So, so that's that. Now, uh, about the work. So this is a book I found in that library, that's Geometry of Numbers of Minkowski, and it's about lattices. Uh, so lattice theory, so you have very rigid things, lattices, and you have some geometry, and what's the interaction? Uh, so, okay, lattices, counting. Now, I learned about this uh, theorem of Minkowski uh, in high school. Uh, here is the simplest formulation. You look at the lattice of co-volume one, okay? So, and then you look at the convex symmetric domain of area bigger than four. And then the conclusion is there is an extra lattice point. That is, of course, a zero, but then it's also something else. Now, that is the kind of most beautiful incarnation of that, and that's from my high school notes that how this thing is proved. You make little balls, you enlarge them, they cover, and things like this. So it's a characteristic from Minkowski that, you know, very general geometric assumptions, and then you have this statement about lattice points. Now, here is an application. Uh, you look at the number field. So what's a number field? It's just a vector space, a finite dimensional vector space over Q. And uh, well, it's spanned by roots of a polynomial of degree D over there. And uh, so it's a vector space you know how to add. And then you want to learn how do you multiply. Well, you multiply by whenever you see alpha to the D, you just replace it by this linear combination in the previous powers of alpha. OK, so it's a field. and. Uh, uh, it has a ring of integers. It's all those elements that satisfy an equation with leading coefficient one and uh, all other coefficients integers. Now, there is a thing of a discriminant of a field. So it's the following symmetric expression. You take all the roots, uh, you take these pairwise uh, differences, square it, and uh, because it's symmetric in the permutation of roots, you know you can write it in terms of the coefficients of uh, the polynomial. Okay, now uh, the lattice theorem, lattice point theorem that I uh, gave you proves that there are no fields with discriminant one. No such things. Now, what does it mean in practice? I give you a cubic equation. You know what the discriminant of cubic is. Minus 4p squared minus 4p cubed minus 27q squared is one. Minkowski tells you, you cannot solve this in integers P and Q. Now, if I just give it to you, like an algebraist, without any of that background and the lattice theory and so on and so on, it's a hopeless undertaking. It looks like a mass Olympics problem, but 
it's already hopeless in degree 3. Now imagine I give you something at degree 10. So these expressions, these symmetric functions, I mean, in, in the expressions and the coefficients of that polynomial, well, how many variables do you have? Well, as many as you have uh, things here. So you have a huge number of variables, big degrees, and I tell you that this equation, this thing, equal to 1 has no solutions. There is no way you can approach this if you didn't have that lattice theory in the background. So it's actually a stunning thing. Now, this result and related results are the foundation for essentially everything effective that we know these days in arithmetic geometry. So in one way or another, everything will reduce to statements like this. So now let me give you some conjectures. So you start counting number fields with discriminant bounded by B. OK, the discriminant, you know, it's this expression, it, there are finitely many number fields, it turns out, with bounded discriminant. So you can ask, well, how many are there? And, uh, well, uh, for degree C, it was known classically, 4 and 5, Bargava did. And uh, then there is the result of Ellenberg van Katesh, a bound on the number, and the conjecture is linear. And it's, you know, far, you don't know anything in degree 6, 7, and 8, and so on. So, uh, okay. Now, so I showed you one particular equation in two variables, you know, 4p cubed, 27q squared. So let's pick any equation in two variables, okay, of degree at least 3, and let's try to solve that equation equal to 1. So Ziegel says there are finitely many solutions, and in fact, you can bound the size of the solutions effectively in terms of coefficients of f. So we're doing in, in, integral, everything, the Fenton equations, integers. So, but if you look at homogeneous equations, now you're looking at rational points. Homogeneous means, you know, x, y, z are determined only by multiplication, yeah? So then Faltings proves there are finitely many solutions, but you don't have an effective bound on the size of the solutions. That's a strange thing about this. He proves there is an effective bound I on... Ziegel's not effective. Ziegel? Not effective? special numbers, Baker's method. Baker's method, that's what I'm thinking they of. They don't work in general. So, well, for elliptic curves they do, but not integer points. So, uh, the, the Falting theorem gives an effective bound on the number of solutions, but not on the size. And does the, all the methods give a bound on the number. I not. thought of Baker's method, that Baker's, you know, Baker's actually. Give on the actual size of the solution. Size of the solution, Baker's method. I thought about that, applying that. All right. So that's an open thing. But uh, uh, so what you could prove, though, with Bogomolov, is that if you have uh, like effective model for one very simple curve like this, then you get effective model for any hyperelliptic curve. And uh, so. Uh, Try to do it for one. OK. Now, next thing is, uh, uh, well, how do you put together uh, spheres and uh, the sphere packing thing? And Hales uh, uh, wrote about this. Uh, it's hard to read, but I mean, you know the story. Uh, big conjecture. We organized the symposium on evidence that the Sabbath Foundation. Did you just mean like a concrete bound, like the, as a function of the degree of your polynomial? Like, so you know it's finite, but you don't know a, a number bound? So I think you know the number, I mean, but you don't know an effective bound on the size. So you can't find some all a priori because you don't know when to stop. There is no algorithm. I mean, there is an algorithm that will stop, but it's not an algorithm that has an a priori bound of time. Right, so what, what the proof normally gives these, say, Faltings or Ziegel before him is that the number of solutions is at most 10. It ah, depends it on your coefficients, but all you do is you find one solution. Because the, the proof is ineffective in that it uses 10 solutions to show there isn't an 11th one. Oh, I see. So you, may, and you don't know any bound on the coefficients of the solution, so you don't know yeah, where That's the problem. Get from that, uh, there's a proof by contradiction. You don't know which way you went. So you, oh, you, I see. You, you so only bound the number. So it might be 9, but not 10. So that, I see. OK, OK. You don't know when to stop. Yeah, so it, it, will it will stop, but you don't know when. Right, right. And that's, 
anyways, there are some algorithms that. So in arithmetic geometry, you want an a priori bound of time in terms of the inputs. No, yeah, I was just wondering if it's like similar to Hubert's like finite generation of the rings, but it's different. Okay, so you don't know about that. That, by the way, is effective. Yeah. They, they, that, but not by Hilbert. That was Popper. Not by Hilbert, by 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 others. Yeah, uh, Kemper and let's see, uh, Popov and, and Popov and then uh, Dirksen. Yeah, right. Dirksen and yeah. yeah. But um, okay. So um, anyway, so we had a symposium at the Simons Foundation on on Hales, who was working for many years to you know write special software that would check his original proof, and at the time. It wasn't completely verified yet, so we are, he finished all the calculations the summer later. But uh, it was kind of interesting, the conversation we were having. Uh, somebody in the audience says, well, okay, you're gonna verify it on a computer, but suppose a photon hits your core and you get it wrong, you know, something goes wrong. What do, you, what do you do then? What does it mean to verify whatever you do on a computer? You know, if it's just a machine, I mean, it could be wrong, there could be some chip problem. In fact, uh, actually, I encountered something like this. I had um, um, a postdoc, David Harvey, at Courant, who ran a big computation computing class numbers, cyclotomic fields, and the Texas supercomputer. And uh, because there is so much consistency in these tables, he found a flaw in the architecture of the computer. It's pretty unbelievable, actually. So there was a systematic error that he discovered, it's written up in his sink. He, the, the first 163 million is joint paper with Buhler. So, David Harvey and Buhler. It was, anyway, so this kind of number theoretical computations because there's so much structure, so you get, it, it's not an empty thing about the photon hitting a core, I mean. So, and then of course it was solved, you know that, apples, oranges, and so on. Another thing that Minkowski studied was polytopes, and uh, he liked polytopes. He liked polytopes. Uh, these are notes of some seminars. Uh, you find polytopes in nature. So this is some animal that likes to take this shape. Um, now, okay, you encounter polytopes in lattice point counts. Uh, so for example, you want to count number of lattice points in a polytope. You translate this into some algebraic geometry and then uh, it's a dimension of some space of global sections of some line bundle that counts number of lattice points on the polytope. And that's kind of a non-trivial thing that you can use algebraic geometry to prove something about, let's say, combinatorics or lattice points counts and polytopes. I don't know whether we'll computer science encounter anything like this. But polytopes, uh, of course, these days are everywhere. So I just wrote down a few things that uh, you know, I came across from time to time. Uh, in uh, asymptotics of integrals, oscillatory integrals, you find this, in uh, special functions, in real algebraic geometry, but uh, also a lot in algebraic geometry, in uh, classifications, problems, uh, minimal model program. Uh, you really need to understand cones uh, for algebraic geometry. Now let's go back, to, let's so now talk about uh, uh, um, that's closer to what I do. So let's look at this uh, equation. So A, B, C are integers, and you're asking, well, when does this thing uh, have solutions in the integers? And the answer is, well, first of all, you have to satisfy you know, congruence conditions, and you have to have solutions over the reals. Okay, now, but the proof of Legendre says that the height of the smallest solution is bounded by something effective in the coefficients. So, okay, so you can just exhaust that bound, then you'll find your solutions, you'll, you'll have it. Now, this again is the basis for everything else we know about effectivity. So when you look at the Hasselminkowski principle, you take, you know, quadrics and uh, uh, browser very varieties and things like this in higher dimensions, everything is reduced essentially to this. And this is a lattice point count. If you've ever taught kind of this kind of number theory in class, you know you're just counting lattice points and there is some excess and you do this. But uh, suppose you wanted to prove something like this for this diagonal cubic surface. Well, we don't know. There is no a priori bound and in fact there is no algorithm to figure out whether or not this equation has solutions in the integers. 
you can check local solvability. That's a finite problem because you only have to check primes that divide you know, the coefficients. OK. Now, that's finitely many possibilities. You check it for all the others. There's a general theorem that says that if the number of variables is bigger than uh, the degree, you'll always have non-trivial solutions. Mm, but uh, in general, we don't know. OK, so the main questions in arithmetic geometries that are of interest to me are, is there this local global principle, the hassel minkowski principle? Can you uh, decide existence of solutions of the integers from these local considerations? And then can you bound, for example, the size of the smallest solution of these polynomial equations? Now, uh, the other thing is, well, related to this, let's put things in a box and count how many solutions are in a box. And then uh, if you have a family like this, ax squared plus by squared plus z squared equals zero, you could view it as a family with the coefficients a, b, c varying. You can ask, well, for how many a, b, c's do we have solutions? That's another interesting question to ask. And then you could also ask, well, then what's the smallest rational point? Uh, you know, f for that somehow. Now, uh, the hassel minkowski principle is in general this conclusion that you have points locally for all completions and you have points globally. And uh, it holds for quadrics and hypersurfaces of small degree. Uh, now, uh, there is a counterexample, I should give you some proof uh, uh, where the hassel principle doesn't uh, hold. So. OK, so this is going to be a proof. So we look at this equation, y squared x4 minus z to the fourth. So it's a hyperliptic curve, very similar to what we've seen before. OK. Now it has solutions uh, modulo p for all primes. But it has no solutions in the integers, uh, clearly solutions in the reals. OK. So how do you check the solutions for all primes? As I said before, you just check you know, the divisors of the coefficients. And in this case, it's OK. So, uh, so here's the proof. So we're going to assume that GCD of the x, y, z is 1, because otherwise you start dividing by the primes dividing you know, two of them. It has to divide here. And OK, GCD is 1. Now, if p divides y, y, so then modulo p, 17, is a square, at least. OK. But there is quadratic reciprocity. 17 is 1 mod 4. So p has to be a square modulo 17. So every prime that divides uh, z, y, uh, OK, uh, has to be a square modulo 17. So now you look at this equation modulo 17. Everything that divides y is a square modulo 17. So modulo 17, y squared is actually a fourth power. OK? So OK. So y squared is a fourth power. We are looking at the equation x to the 4 is 2 times y1 to the 4. So we're going to raise this equation to the power 4. So we find x to the 16 is 16 y1 to the 16. Well, modulo 17, Fermat's little theorem, this is 1. This is 1, and you find the equation 1 is minus 1. So that means there are no solutions in the integers for this equation. OK, so that's a proof. So what have we used apart from trivial manipulations? The real input here is this, is quadratic reciprocity. That's the only non-trivial, if you like, input into this example. And uh, uh, you could try to do something like this in higher dimensions. So I showed you a curve. So this is a surface. So this, for example, is a family of conics. x squared <laughs> plus y squared is z squared. And one coefficient changes in this particular fashion. So it's just a family of conics. So it's a surface. And this surface happens to have solutions modulo all primes, but no solutions over the integers. Now, this is another surface, a cubic surface, similar to the one I showed you, the diagonal one. It has solutions modulo primes, but no solutions globally. And so how do you do it? Well, you use some kind of quadratic cubic reciprocity, and so divisibility of class numbers and things like this. So there is a general framework that deals with these questions, and it's the Brouwer group. So what is the Brouwer group? Well, uh, we've seen you know, conics before. And conics, they can either have points or not have points. 
So a brow group, it's, uh, so we view this conic as kind of a representative of a brow group. The brow group is something that would classify these things that uh, are geometrically, for example, conics or projective spaces, but not over the ground field. In any event, there is this uh, functor from schemes to groups, it's a brow group, and once you have it kind of a functor, you have arrows between these things, and an existence of a point over the rationals will give you an arrow from here to here. Existence of local points will give you an arrow from here to here, but then there is kind of a basic exact sequence here, and so an abstraction to the existence of point here is simply that uh, for every local point, you end up in here with a non-zero element, and that can actually be computed. So you go through this kind of diagram, okay, so the rational points will lie in the intersection of all these things, and the brow are unobstructed Adels, local points, and uh, well, it can be analyzed. So Manin, who formulated this, he gives a much more systematic approach to these local global principles, and identifies the algebraic structure behind the abstraction. And so we worked it out, we looked at you know, some other surfaces, I showed you this conic bundle, which is a degree four del Petzo surface, the cubic surface is classical. This is the next on the list, it's a degree two del Petzo surface, so there's a classification of uh, surfaces. And uh, in fact, uh, we got interested in an algorithmic issue here. Is there an effective algorithm to compute this abstraction? And what we showed is that there is one. So for geometrically rational surfaces, there is actually an effective algorithm with a priori bounded time. Based, I mean, bounded time, yeah, the function of coefficients. So for example, here we can effectively compute the Brownian abstraction and we can effectively determine when the set uh, is non-empty of uh, Brownian unobstructed points. We still don't know, we still don't have an algorithm to determine when this thing is solvable because, and that's a big conjecture in the field, uh, are these the only abstractions and the conjecture is that there are. Um, now, we've also looked at integral points, not only rational points. Look at this equation here. Uh, we find that it has solutions mod p for all primes, but no solutions in z. However, solutions in q. That's kind of cute. So you can solve it in the rationals, you can solve it modulo primes, but not in the integers. You can look at this equation. Uh, there are no abstractions uh, to solving this for many n for example, n equals 33, but no solutions are known by computer, and I had my postdocs run the computers pretty high. I mean, at that time, you know, they exhausted uh, the computer power, but uh, so conjecture would be that there are solutions, but we can't find any. Okay, so anyway, there is this general thing which says that the Brownian abstraction to existence of rational points should be the only one, and there is a lot of work uh, on that conjecture, and um, uh, you know some partial results. Anyway, so then, if we had that, then you would have an effective algorithm to decide existence of partial points. So that's one thing: existence of solutions. Then you can ask, well, how many solutions are there? You can try to count lattice points in uh, symmetric domains, and as you can imagine, it's volume plus error term. So then you want to compute the volume, which is easy in this case, but not so easy for general things. And then you want to show that the error term is smaller than the main term. So uh, in this example, if you look at lattice points up to plus minus one, and also under the assumption that GCD is one, then what we are counting is actually rational points on P1. Because as I said in homogeneous things, you don't uh, distinguish things that differ by the same vector. So you can represent the point here as x0, x1 with co-prime integer coefficients up to plus minus one. Okay, so now we're counting lattice points in this ball, growing ball, and so the area is pi r squared, so pi b squared in this case, and then you have to account for plus minus one, that's one half, and then you have to account for co-primality. That's one over data two. Now why is that? Because the probability of dividing both x0 and x1 is one over p, one over p, it's one over p squared. So the other probability is one minus one over p squared, and then you multiply over all primes, and that's what you get. So now what is this? It's uh, this times this, and then uh, 
This is actually number of points in P1 or a finite field divided by P to the dimension, which is one, and then some regularizing factor. This is how we interpret this. And so this is what you see in general. You want to count solutions on algebraic varieties, solutions of these equations that have many, uh, then uh, you find uh, this in the leading constant. So P1, so why P1? Well, P1 is sort of the simplest thing that we can think of, and there are many ways of thinking about P1. You can think of P1 as a compactification of the affine line. You can think of P1 as compactifications of a torus, which is the affine line minus zero, invertible elements. Or you can think this as a flag variety, a variety of flags, it's PGL2 over the Braille subgroup. So, and you can also think of P1 as the representative of what's known as the Petsu surfaces, like a cubic surface, or complete intersections of small degree and products of projective spaces and things like this. Or even more generally, there is this notion of rationally connected varieties where every pair of points is connected by P1. And obviously on P1, everything is connected by P1. But in higher dimensions, there is more space for these rational curves. And so then, you know, a chain of P1s. So the counting problem then becomes you have your variety, it's a solution of a system of polynomial equations, you put it into some projective space, you fix some height function, which is like square root of sum of squares of the coordinates, and then you ask, well, um, you know, how many points do you have? And the asymptotic is b to the a log b to the b minus one, and with some constant c, and uh, you could try to apply this general conjecture in practice. And the favorite example is cubic surfaces in particular singular cubic surfaces. So here's a picture of what a cubic surface looks like if you make it singular. So there are different singularities. You can you know, go from here to there. And you're looking for lattice points that happen to lie on these shapes, right? So I think the picture shows that it's really kind of a non-trivial problem because uh, you know, lattice points are so, hmm, it's a lattice. And then to lie on something like this is not so easy, and the answer is you always get b log b to the six in these cases. Where does that come from? So then you can try to plot your solutions. So you pick an equation like this, and you run it on a computer, so you get you know, points scattered all over. You see uh, you know, there are certain accumulation places here for the points, but otherwise they're somehow distributed. So uh, well, and you can prove it. So in this case, uh, my student Derenthal, jointly with Delibertesh Browning, established the asymptotic formula, and the leading constant looks like this. Number of points over a finite field, mod p, divided by p squared. Again, this regularizing factor, which this time is the seventh power. Then this thing, which looks uh, uh, difficult, but is actually simply the real analog of this thing. This integral and this thing, they're essentially the same. They're computed in the same fashion. Then there's a constant which is one, in this case, but not one in general. And then there's another constant here, which is the volume of a certain polytope. How do you get this polytope? You take a cone of effective divisors, you slice it by a certain hyperplane section, which is anti-canonical class dot something equals one, you get the polytope, and that's the volume of that polytope. So it's a problem from linear, I don't know, uh, something, programming or whatever, so that spits out these kind of constants in asymptotic formulas. Now these cones of effective dividers, they can be very complicated, and so you get rather complicated expressions there. So I printed you know, another set of solutions, another equation, here, and so there is a whole industry counting points on surfaces, and, and uh, many, many people, Browning, uh, Fauvry, his Brown, Moreau, Salberger. So uh, that's a big F -F area. So finally, you want to know what are the constants A and B that showed up, and there is uh, an explanation, a geometric explanation for all the invariants involved, in particular for the distinguished the anti-canonical embedding, which for a cubic surface is simply the standard embedding into P3, is a cubic hypersurface. 
you find b to the 1 log b to the b minus 1, where that little b is the rank of the Picard group, a geometric invariant of the surface. That can be computed effectively. So there are uh, many results in a group theoretic context for uh, uh, counting rational points, and there are many results for counting integral points, and Peter was involved with this uh, uh, for many years. So what this conjecture uh, here suggests that if you want to look at the smallest point, you see this is the asymptotic for points of bounded height. Well, you think that when you look at that height up to B, that the points don't really accumulate. I mean, you don't expect the points to be accumulating here or there. You expect them to be kind of equidistributed between 0 and B. So if this is the number of points up to height B, then what's the smallest point? So the smallest point should somehow be related to, well, that constant that we're seeing here. And so you can try to tease it out from numerical data. And so the height of the smallest point, uh, so here's a plot for you know, some Delpezzo surfaces, Fano threefolds, and so on. So this is a typical plot. So how should you read this? Of course, you can always cook up the coefficients in such a way that you have kind of a uh, very, very small solution with large coefficients. You can say like 1,000 x cubed uh, minus 1,001 y cubed. So clearly, you know, 1 and 1, this minus that. So you can always match things. But if you take typical coefficients and you try to satisfy your equation, then it's not so easy. And then it's kind of really related to the Tamagawa number, which is a product of these local densities that I wrote down. Can you explain the picture? What are the axes? So this is a Tamagawa number. This is a product of local densities. And that's the height of the smallest point. So you see that dependence. OK? So in Tamagawa number, it's a product over, you know, number of points over a finite field over p to the dimension, regularized properly, and then similar thing at infinity as well. Do you understand why there are those bends at the bottom? So that comes, what I said, where you always, you can always cook up points of small height by doing strange things. So choosing a surface. Choosing a surface for that. And so you can get points of very small height, right? but for large coefficients, so to speak, by cooking them up in such a way that the, the difference is small. So that's kind of the non-typical behavior. But then, once you get into So OK, so to summarize, uh, you know, what is arithmetic geometry? So there is this interplay between these lattices, rigid structures, and geometry. And you try to understand how, you know, how to put lattice points on these geometric shapes. Then, uh, so what kind of techniques uh, do we use? Well, first of all, to get any conjectures, we always run things on computers, uh, big computations. So when trying to find these asymptotics of points of bounded height. So you've seen an asymptotic which looked like b times log b to the sixth. Well, how do you find numerical? Is it log b to the sixth or log b to the seventh? Right? So you need to explore pretty high up. And so we actually did it in some specific computations where you have to, you know, your points are integers. You have to integers of size, you know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then you try to satisfy these equations. You have four variables. So you get very quickly into um, So, uh, but finally, when you want to prove your predictions, so what kind of techniques do we use? So we use massively harmonic analysis. So on the DELs, representation theory, it's either uh, you know, commutative harmonic analysis or non-commutative harmonic analysis. So we analyze the spectral decompositions of some generating series um, and, well, harmonic analysis. We use representation theory. You need to know something about representations that show up in the non-commutative setting. And then this analytic and algebraic geometry that plays a role because already in those interpretations of the constants, there are those these terms that you may not know, effective divisors, Picard groups, things like this. Uh, well, this is what comes out. So maybe for sort of down to earth computer science, so you take your favorite matrix, let's say upper triangular matrices, right? And you look at an algebraic representation of such a thing. Let's be even simpler. Heisenberg group. You know, x, y, z. You want to understand the orbit of this under some algebraic representation. 
you can put it into very high dimensional space by simply putting this matrix into some much, much larger matrix, right? Representation. Then you look at the orbit. And then you look at lattice points on this orbit. And our methods produce asymptotics for the number of lattice points on these very, very thin orbits in high dimensional spaces. We get precise formulas with these kind of invariants that we can sort of pre-compute. Now, that ought to be relevant for something in computer science. Because again, if I had to draw you, I mean, the shapes of these orbits, they are very interesting. In fact, algebraic geometrically, there are no classification schemes for these. If you look at the unipotent groups, like upper triangular groups, then the modelized spaces of these representations, they are sort of wild. Embedded components, uh, there is no good theory for that. So uh, now that's it, and I wanted to finish with uh, like a quote from my friend and uh, co-author, Maxim Kontsevich. Um, anyway, so very often a mathematician considers his colleague from a different domain with disdain. What kind of perverse joy can this guy find in his unmotivated and plainly boring subject? I've tried to learn the hidden beauty in various things, but still for many areas, the source of interest is for me a complete mystery. So my theory is that too often people project their human weaknesses properties onto their mathematical activity. There are no obvious, ex uh, there are obvious examples on the surface. For instance, the idea of a classification of some objects is an incarnation of collector's instincts. The search for maximal values is another form of greed. Computability disability comes from the desire of a total control. I think that's mostly relevant for this community here, yes. Fascination with iterations is similar to the hypnotism of rhythmic music. Of course, the classification of some kinds of objects could be very useful in the analysis of more complicated structures and so on and so on and so on. Anyway, so I hope you know, I could show you at least some of the stuff that I do and thank you for your attention. Curious about your um, reference to the mistake that occurred uh, during verifying calculations. Yeah. And you were saying that, that it was due to the fact that there was some structure in the calculations and there was one bug that was repeatedly uh, sort of screwing up the calculations because there was because of structure, right? So there was some bug in the computer, in the yeah. supercomputer, yeah. that they discovered because uh, class groups, yeah. there is so much internal structure there yeah. that you, when you produce these tables, you want to reference and cross-reference and match, and when you discover there's some kind of systematic mistake, then, well, you check and recheck, there's a mistake, there must be a mistake somewhere, it must be in the hardware, and they found it, and they write about it in their paper, and that I found really striking. Uh, you wouldn't have seen this otherwise. If you do climate or a forecast, you're not finding these kind of systematic mistakes, because, okay, there's a cloud. Well, maybe it should be there, maybe it shouldn't be there. But when you do num number fields, class groups, you, you don't have clouds. I mean, it's so rigid. There was this uh, Manuel Blum, when he was here, he had this whole area of research about, uh, about how to verify, in some sense, calculations. I mean, he called it more generally. And uh, the idea was that he had uh, another program, which was simpler in some quantifiable way, uh, sense, that would verify exact calculations. Um, so uh, even the trivial example, like GCD, so I, I think he, that was his prime example. In the beginning, there was a TI calculator, and he spit out GCD, and apparently there was a bug. But they never checked it. So th there was never a check that the GCD was correct. It would just be you know, some equa the Euclid equation equals to D, and they divide it. So this brought out a whole area of research. So I was just wondering, you know, even without finding the bug, it, because in this example, they found it, okay, because the cross thing didn't work. But it, in some sense, it's consistency checking. Also. Consistency so, checking, yeah. Uh, so what's the name of the book that they... So it's not the book, it's a paper by Joe Buller and uh, David Harvey. It's called the 163 million, I don't know, anyway, psychotomic fields. Yeah. So the unintended consequence. Yeah. Super <laughs> The bug was in the supercomputer. It was in the hardware. The bug was in the hardware. Any supercomputing system is subject to faults. Even your laptop is subject to faults, but it occurs on your laptop only once in, in a month or so. Imagine now a supercomputing system. Every processor, you know, but that's once in a while. Is so, so there is a whole area of fault tolerance and, you know, how to 
to guard against those faults. So I, I would be very curious whether it was just, you know, because the system was large. Yeah. And so they did it several times to, to, to be sure that it's really a bug in, in the hardware. They did these, they ran them. The first time they saw the problem, they, they thought, okay, but then but every, repeatedly. But every system necessarily has faults. That's, yeah. But if you do it repeatedly and you find the same issue, then there is something in the some structural issue, yes. So I guess that's all I'm... If you're verifying is independent of that, in some sense, independent of the calculation itself, then the chance you would have two errors that kind of consistent with each other is unlikely, right? Mm -hmm. I think some of that theory was to use that logic. Anyway, I was impressed. I mean, I'm not super computing there, but uh, these guys were, and uh, that they ran into this um, that I found striking. Yeah. Can you say a word? These conjectures of money are actually false in some cases. You didn't point that out. But has that been reconciled? Do we know when to expect them? So there is a lot of work, even recent work from last year, um, by Tanimoto, Lehman, uh, and others. Um, to uh, re understand the geometric uh, constraints coming out of Manning's conjecture, cons geometric consistency of these things. I mean, there was a counterexample of Victor Butler and myself some 20 years ago to a strong form of Manning's conjecture. We found that there is some excess of solutions that uh, Manning didn't predict. Uh, we got it from geometry that wasn't apparent at the time the conjectures were formulated. Now, uh, okay, uh, there is now a different formulation that um, would account for our counterexample, but of course, and there is even one instance, a recent paper by his Brown and Browning, where they prove um, a theorem about, well, okay, the equation is ax squared plus by squared plus z squared plus dt squared equals zero. So it's now quadrics in four variables, and now A, B, C, D and X, Y, D, T, they are considered as variables. So you're sitting sort of in P3 times P3 and you have a hypersurface of by degree 2, 2. So you can either view this as a family of quadrics this way or a family of quadrics this, uh, like 1, 2, sorry. It's like A, B, C is linear and the X, Y, Z is quadratic. So, and in, this is the first instance where you see this kind of accumulating behavior that would contradict Manning's conjecture. And they proved the version, the modified conjecture in this case. So there's at least one instance, which is very hard, actually. Their paper is very hard. It's a spectacular paper. But uh, so there is hope that uh, the geometric ins issues that have been identified will cover, in fact, everything so that you have more or less a complete picture as to what should be true in, in our dimensions when we expect many points. But I have to say that. You know, in particular, the conjecture predicts that uh, points are dense in the risky topology, for example, and we don't know that for certain hypersurfaces. Take a hypersurface of degree 5 and P5. The points are supposed to be dense, let's say, after some extension of the ground field, and we don't have any tools for proving this. So not to mention Manning's conjecture. Even density we can't prove. So and that's... So coming back to the Lopezzo surface, like the cubic surface, so the conjecture is for the anti-canonical. Right. What happens if I vary this over the ample count? So, so there is the precise conjecture due to, to yes. Other points that like a nice behavior Absolutely. inside the ample count. Absolutely. So are you right? So, okay. So correctly, if there is so there is a distinguished anti-canonical embedding. So this is your Picard. Okay. So and you could take a different line bundle that gives a different embedding into projective space. Let's say this is the F line bundle. So then the constant A in the asymptote is going to be B to the A log B. Is it not legible mostly? Yes, yeah, I realize that. B to the A log B to the B minus one. So the A is this number here. So A times L plus KX is uh, on the boundary of the effective cone. Nice. So it's this number here. So that when you take this vector, multiply this A, you're exactly here. This is the effective cone shifted by the anti-canonical class. So this specializes to the previous case when L is minus Kx, you're finding A is equal to 1, and that would be B to the 1. That's a linear growth. 
Now the log here, it's the co-dimension of the face that you're hitting. So this smells very much like log canonical threshold. Absolutely, this is what it is. This is, uh, it's, uh, it showed up in the minimal model program. In fact, it's called uh, um, Fujita Energy. It should happen for Jita's version of the minimal model program. Because if you had the ample cone instead, it would be directly Mori's threshold thing. But because you have the effective cone, it's, a, it's for Jita. Ample and effective are related. Ample is inside. Effective is a little bit bigger in general and so on. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty geometric picture. So it's, it's a nice. Yes. So, so you mentioned this uh, Haas uh, Poincaré principle. Haas, uh, Minkowski principle. Uh, and uh, you had some specific equations for which it's false. So is it, yes. is it hard to find those or for random, like for random equation? Oh, that's a wonderful question. There are papers on that actually. How many ABCDs or how many members of your family does, uh, first of all, do you have local solvability for all primes? And secondly, uh, when you have local solvability, do you have its Brownian abstraction for okay. primes? So let me give you one thing that's, uh, uh, so that maybe appeared in some, okay, ax squared plus by squared plus ez squared, right? You want to understand a, b, c so that you have solutions. Okay, so when is it that you don't have solutions? You don't have solutions if a prime divides one of the variables here, and if this over this, maybe minus, is not a square, modulo that prime. So what's the probability for that? Well. Dividing is like one over p, and then square not square is like one half, and then, uh, well, it could be a, b, or c. We have three things that are like three halves, and then you look at the one minus that, and you look at the product, and so uh, heuristic argument tells you it should be well maybe b cubed over something like log b three halves, right? That's what you would get from this kind of Euler product. It's actually very hard to prove. There is a proof over the rationals. But if you want to do it over a number field, there is no proof. Now, this is a special thing. You can look at uh, more general families, where you have like families of conics, not over a two-dimensional base. This is ABC, so this is P2, projective space. So you have a family of conics over P2 with ramification along three lines. Ramification means that the line A equals zero, the conic collapses, so to speak, right? It's kind of degenerate. The conic drops rank along the three lines. Now you can look at arbitrary base space, um, and you could look at families of conics or families of you know, other things like this. So that has been addressed. Now, finding the Brownian obstructed thing, that's uh, much tougher. So I tried to do that for the family of cubics, this one, cubics plus, uh, let's say, d t cubed equals 0 uh, many, many years ago. You don't get interesting logs. You just change the constant a little bit. So, but indeed, you can show that you know, general member in some family, you know, maybe positive proportion of them, of course, you know, satisfy, don't satisfy local abstractions for all primes. And then you can have other points, other no points. I mean, Bargava and his, uh, his collaborators worked on that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I look at some other examples. Yeah? What was the setting for that conjecture that the Bremer-Mannion obstruction is basically the only obstruction? Oh, that's a beautiful question. So, uh, well, the arithmetic is governed. OK, take a cubic surface, 27 lines of the complex numbers. Have you, have you, do you all know how to get those 27 lines? Well, anyway, so you get one line first, then you, you know, 27 lines on a cubic surface. So, but over non-closed field, there is a Galois action on those 27 lines. And then we say we can compute effectively Brouwer line abstractions. The first step in this direction is to effectively compute the action of the Galois group in terms of the coefficients. So this boils down to computing the Galois group of a polynomial of high degree. Let's say 27. Okay, so, and uh, then the next step is uh, you compute something called the Gallo cohomology. So the 27 lines span this thing which is called the Picard group, which for the cubic surface is z to the 7. Okay, the interesting part is like z to the 6. 
Because the anti-canonical class, it's so canonical that it's sort of Gallo invariant always, you can look at its complement with respect to the intersection pairing. So that letter z to the six, that knows about the action of the Gallo group on the lines. Okay, so there is like a group cohomology, H1, so the Gallo group acting on that thing. This is an abstraction to, let's say, rationality of the thing of the ground field and so on. And what uh, Coyote-Tolan and his collaborators are thinking that, well, this should be, this is a thing that's staring us in the face. And this should be the only abstraction somehow. Now, of course, when you go sort of deep into the theory, it's, uh, it's much more than that. So uh, they have developed something called the theory of universal torsors, which I should probably explain in this connection. If you look at the projective space, like, P1, and I said like x0, x1. I'm actually thinking that I'm taking affine plane, A2, minus zero, and divide by the multiplicative group. So every toric variety can be written as a quotient of an affine space, minus something like this, by some multiplicative group. So what they discovered, that when you do descent on, let's say, cubic surfaces, you find, you probably see in Fermat descent on curves. You want to show that x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed has no solutions. How do you do it? You split it into product of linear forms. Product of linear forms is a cube. Therefore, each linear form has to be a cube. You get extra equations. It's still a curve. Now, when you do it for surfaces, the same thing. Now, you have x cubed plus y cubed is equal z cubed plus t cubed. You split it into linear forms, and you start writing auxiliary equations. What you get is a higher dimensional variety, in fact, of dimension 2 plus 6. In the dimension six, it's like a family of tori of dimension six over the base. So what they conjecture is that that total space is a rational variety over the ground field. That would explain the uniqueness of the Brownian abstraction. And they have proved it in, in some very special circumstances. But, but this is just for cubics. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Um, so well, this is for the Petsu surfaces in general, so those are the things that you get running the minimal model program over non-closed fields in dimension two for geometrically rational surfaces. So the motivation, and why did they think that the thing is rational? Because downstairs with Gallo cohomology is abstracting rationality. But the way these torsos are constructed, upstairs, and this they proved, there is no Brow group for the total thing. Well, if there is no Brow group, if there are no cohomological abstractions to rationality, they thought, well, that should be rational. So, uh, and but now, the of degree zero. they produce, they, they show it in one, in one case they can prove it. For conic bundles with four degenerate fibers, they can prove it. So the first example that I had there is a Skovsky counter example, that x squared plus y squared is a polynomial f of t z squared. If f is degree four, the conjectures are settled. If f is degree five or six, it's totally unclear. So. But there is a lot of work. It's been 40 years, you know, people have tried. So it's very tempting. You know, it's